Next up is Tony Gelsma in biology from Dort University presenting on possible role of own body perception in gender dysphoria. Join me in welcoming Tony. Thank you. Whoa, this is loud. Um, um, I have a larger paper on this whole big topic um, that's coming out in this fall's issue of Perspectives. Um, what I want to do is focus on one small aspect of it, uh, the possible role of own body uh, perception in gender dysphoria. So as we are probably all aware of, um, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of cases of gender dysphoria. Um, gender dysphoria has always existed at a relatively low level, but recently, especially in, in natal females, those numbers have increased. So the question is, why is that happening? Um, one possible cause is that we're better at diagnosing the condition. Also, now that there's more acceptance of, of trans people in our society, more people may be willing to come out and, and say they have it. But is there more to it than this? Um, before I go into the details, as Christians, we need to involve um, science as well as, as just talking about the mind. So I'm a biologist and we can't ignore the, the role of biology in gender perception. Um, I need to note that gender and sex are different things. We have biological sex, gender is something, something different. So contrary to what some people claim, gender dysphoria is not something we can just wish away. Um, and I hear that far too often. Maybe in some cases it has happened, but that's not something we can assume. Neither is gender a social construct that you can just kind of make up as you see fit. I should note, however, that gender roles may be socially constructed. So here's the outline of my presentation. I'm going to talk about gender dysphoria, and there are really two models for that. I think both of them occur, um, the brain sex model and the body image perception model. I'm going to spend much more time on the second one. Um, and then to unpack that, I want to look at, well, what does perception involve? What about body and uh, self and body image perception? And how does that develop in adolescence? And then how could that apply to gender? So let me unpack some of that. Um, so, gender dysphoria is the stress associated with the incongruence between one's biological sex and perceived gender. Note that gender is something entirely internal. It's how you sense yourself to be, not on how you act. How you act may follow from how you perceive yourself to be, but it's, it's, it's different. The other difference is, or distinction I need to make, is um, same-sex attraction versus gender. And that's often a confounding factor. Someone may be same-sex attracted and think that they are uh, actually trans. So we need to be careful to, to distinguish that as well. Two types of, of gender dysphoria are the early onset and the late onset. And so what can we learn about those? Um, we'll talk about the early onset, which is what I think the previous talk um, dealt with, and then spend most of the time on the later onset. So this is the, the brain sex model of gender dysphoria. As we heard, if you have a, this is the typical developmental pattern. If you have a Y chromosome, you've got an S or Y gene. There's a structure called the genital ridge where that S or Y gene gets turned on at about six weeks of age. If it's there, testes develop. If it's not there, ovaries do, will develop. As these testes develop, testosterone levels increase. They will cause the reproductive organs to develop in the male pattern. If it's not there, then it develop in the female pattern. As the development continues, testosterone levels will increase. They will enter the brain in order to masculinize the brain. I have to note here, though, there's an enzyme called aromatase, and aromatase converts some of that testosterone to estrogen. We know in rodents that it's actually estrogen that masculinizes the male brain. Um, in humans, that's unethical to do those experiments, um, but we know that aromatase is present, estrogen is present, so is testosterone, but it's not entirely clear. But basically, if you have testosterone, typically your brain will be masculinized. And one can easily under imagine a scenario where the reproductive organs develop into one or the other sex, whereas the brain develops into the other, one or the other gender, so you can get an incongruence there. So that's the brain sex model, and that's about all I'm going to say on it. And so here's my tentative model that, um, to explain late onset gender dysphoria. 
there's a very high incidence of comorbidities like stress and depression. We've heard some of those talks today as well in people with, gen with gender dysphoria, I mean, generally, but also gender dysphoria. Our sense of self, our body image, and our emotional responses, they develop profoundly in adolescence. Thirdly, those comorbidities that these people have, um, that, can be that can destabilize their sense of their body image. And then lastly, cultural and social media influences and affirmative counseling can increase this misperception. So let me unpack that. First of all, we know that people are stressed. Um, COVID uh, pandemic didn't help things, but even before that, the levels of stress and anxiety were, were quite high. Um, and earlier studies, even, even more so in adolescent girls. Social, social isolation, which the pandemic uh, certainly um, increased, um, that can also contribute to these increases. And, and we'll talk about social isolation a little bit later. This is one study of people who came to a gender, dysphoria, a gender clinic in Australia, and they said these numbers are typical. We see a very high rate of things like family conflict, uh, parental mental illness, things, bullying and things like that, and also depression, anxiety, behavior disorders, really high numbers. And, so, and even those numbers are so that people coming there may have more than one of these issues. And I need to be clear here that it's not clear what's cause and effect. You can imagine someone who, who has gender dysphoria, that can cause family conflict and bullying and things like that. So it's, the two seem to be closely tied together. But what's that got to do with gender perception? Well, I want to talk about how we perceive things. So we receive sensory inputs, they go to the brain. Some of those inputs go to the cortex, the conscious um, awareness of what the, sense, what the stimuli are, and some go to the subconscious. Let me unpack that a little bit. So um, our, our cerebral cortex has four, four lobes. Um, our visual inputs go to the occipital lobe. Um, temper or auditory inputs go to the Go to the, sorry, occipital, temporal. Touch inputs go to that blue area there, um, up there, um, which is the, the post-central gyrus. And, and then the purple area of the parietal lobe that kind of integrates the various sensory inputs, brings that information to the, pre, to the frontal lobe where um, decisions are made, planning is made, and then motor output would come from that red pre-central gyrus. So that's the conscious. What about subconscious? Well, a lot of that subconscious involves the, the limbic system. So the limbic system is involved in emotional responses to stimuli. Uh, for example, if we're threatened, we, we might fight or we might run away. Um, if we're hungry, we might eat, that sort of thing. And most of the limbic system involves the subcortical structures, although the, the area in green is, is a cingulate gyrus, and that's also part of the cortex. But we have other structures like the amygdala involved in emotional responses, the hippocampus, and, and and other things like that. Now, in development, the subcortical structures, they mature earlier and before the cortex gets completely matured. And in fact, the cortex itself develops from, front, from back to front so that it's really the prefrontal cortex, this region, that is the last to develop. And it doesn't develop until adulthood. And we keep talking about that as, as um, college professors, how our students' brains aren't completely developed yet. And, and so what happens is when people are challenged with emotional cues, the way they respond, that can change as their brains develop further. So as children, um, those responses are really at a subcortical level, and that's why they can have quite strong emotional responses, impulsivity, inappropriate responses, and things like that. As the children enter adolescence, then you start getting some projections up towards the cortex, and then there's a little bit more checking on the, the responses, and then as they develop further in adolescence, then you get more top-down signals um, that can regulate the emotional responses, so that the children's responses, um, they get more rational, I guess, um, as they get older. And then when you're an adult, then you actually have a cogni cognitive control of your emotions, and so those emotional cues will help you, or help prevent you from um, it responding inappropriately. So there's a lot of difference as the brain develops and as these children are going through adolescence. 
our sense of self likewise develops in adolescence. And you can see the prefrontal cortex there. And so these are um, fMRI studies that were done, and they would ask questions of the subjects that involved self-reflection. And when they'd ask those questions of children, what they found is that the prefrontal cortex, which is immature, that was the area that preferentially would light up. And so the authors say this is re really they're actively constructing those self-descriptive um, attribu self descriptive attributes. So they haven't really worked it out and they're kind of making it up as they go along. If you ask the same sorts of questions of adults, they use different parts of the brain and they use the, the knowledge they already have um, as they self-reflect. So the way that young, so this is children and adults and adolescents are somewhere in between. Um, okay, well that's, that's what normally happens. What about people with gender dysphoria? So here are some studies that were done to look at the brains of people who have gender dysphoria. And what they found is Transgender people, at least in this study, they show weaker structural and functional connections in regions that are known to process own body perception in the context of self. Another study showed reduced development in an area in regions that are shown to process body ownership. So the authors then speculate that this perceptual ambiguity to their, their sense of self could lead to a, a gender ambiguity. Note again, this is correlation. So what's the cause, what's the effect? And the authors acknowledge that the, this difference could be due to developmental changes which cause the gender incongruence, or it could be the other way around. The gender incongruence then causes changes in the way the brain uh, acts because there is neuroplasticity. Okay, now moving on to perception and how we perceive things. And I found this quite surprising. And so this is some material by uh, Anil Seth and, and others. Now, if you think about it, um, we use our senses, we receive, we receive stimuli, um, then our brain gets that information and then figures out, oh, this is what it is, and then we're gonna respond. However, if you do that, we're always a step behind. And that's gonna make us, our responses much slower. So instead, what Seth describes is that we predict what reality is based on partial information. So we get some sensory information, we kind of guess at what it is, and then we can modify those guesses with continuous sensory input. And Neil Seth calls them controlled hallucinations. They're hallucinations because we make them up, but they're controlled because they're continually modified by sensory input. So, it's like, that's kind of weird. I mean, is that really the case? Now, if you look at this, we can all see that upside down triangle, right? It's like, well, not really. There is no upside down triangle there. We're actually making it up based on the sensory types of cues. Now, okay, that's, that's something out there. That's what we see. That really doesn't affect us, does it? Well, that sort of guessing that we're doing based on external stimuli also happens in our own body. And we call that interoception. So our body is then using the internal cues to try to figure out what's going on. Um, so this interoception. So it processes sensory information to drive a physiological representation of the state of the body. So our body needs to figure out what's going on in terms of, um, let's say, blood pressure, blood sugar, blood pH, heart rate, all those sorts of things. And then the brain needs to figure out, okay, what does this mean and how do I need to respond? I'm sure you're all aware of the concept of homeostasis. Our body will respond to things, right? So if, if our blood pH drops, we breathe harder to, um, to correct the situation but homeostasis is always a step behind. So what we also have on top is an allostasis. An allostasis is the predictive element that the brain uses and, uh, and to anticipate upcoming changes. For example, when you eat a meal, your digestive system gets activated before you've even taken a bite. If you're gonna start running a race, your body, your liver's gonna release uh, glucose and you're gonna start breathing harder and all those things before you've even taken a step because that allows our physiology to stay a step ahead in order to, um, in, in order to survive better. 
So a lot of things involve allostasis on top of homeostasis in an anticipatory way. So there's also an emotional component. I talked about emotions earlier. Sensory inputs also have an affective component. Um, so they can make you feel good or not so, or not so good, or they can make you aroused. Um, and they project to different regions of the brain. So as I mentioned before, if we're talking about touch, then the touch inputs, they go to there for a conscious sensation of, well, where am I being touched and what type of touch is it? And those are fast fibers because that information needs to go really quickly. But some structures also go to a different region called the insular cortex. Sorry, let me go back a little bit. Um, there, which the authors say is maybe an important component in the construction of a sense of self. So different types of touch can also contribute to our sense of self. And so what's the relevance of that? I don't know if you're familiar with this, the social touch hypothesis, which is really a stroking type of touch, a gentle type of touch. Um, people who are socially isolated don't have that or don't develop it as much. And that could also um, lead to a reduced sense of self. And therefore, again, you may think this is a stretch. This may make them more susceptible to suggestions of gender uh, incongruence. Again, this, these things are really strange. How can someone misperceive their gender? Well, I don't know how many of you have heard of the rubber hand illusion. And in this, the subjects, they would sit at a table and their hand, arm would be covered and there'd be a rubber hand beside it. And the experimenter would stroke both of them. And so the subject would see the rubber hand and not their own hand. And then over time, with gentle stroking, they would think that the rubber hand belongs to their own body. And in fact, if you stab it with a knife, they freak out. And so that's a rubber hand. It's, it's quite commonly used. So what's that got to do with gender? Well, an analogous experiment was done with a whole body, a body swap type. So here the subjects, they would lie on a bed, they would have virtual reality goggles, and through that they would look down and see a body of the opposite sex to what they had. And then, like in the earlier experiment, the subject would be stroked on the body in a non-sexual place, and what they're seeing through the goggles is also being stroked. And over time, what you can see is their sense of gender would change from one to the other. So these are controls where if the body is the same sex as what they have, nothing happens. And this is what happens if the stroking isn't synchronous. But you can, you can clearly see that their sense of gender will swap. Now, this is just a temporary thing. You take the goggles off and you're fine. True, but these are people who are adults who already have a well-developed sense of what their gender is, and even under these conditions, you can swap it over. What about people who are young, adolescent, stressed, and all those sorts of things? So if we pull these all together, our perception involves guessing, best guesses. Sometimes we can guess wrong, and usually it's corrected, but not always. Our body ownership develops profoundly during adolescence, but as I saw, it is surprisingly malleable. And adolescents, as we know, are increasingly stressed and anxious, and that can affect our body ownership. Social isolation may further destabilize that body ownership. So now if you have individuals who are stressed, depressed, or whatever, um, and then they may be under influence of social media that says, well, you might be trans. And then our culture of expressive individualism says you need to create your own identity. And then if you have people who are affirming you in that decision, you can further solidify the person into that, that uh, directory or into that trajectory. So um, this is my last slide here. Then how to re respond? First of all, empathize in a good way. We just heard that empathy might be a sin, not. Um, and, but don't generalize or jump to conclusions. We need to consider the circumstances and deeper issues, because there usually are far more deeper issues that need to be addressed as well, and provide these people with careful and prayerful support. Thank you. Keep your hands up. Okay. 
I just wonder if you could comment on a situation in my own family, my own daughter, who is uh, t 27 years old now. I have, uh, she has five older brothers and sisters, all heterosexual, cisgendered. And uh, she has most of her life been mildly depressed. And um, she lost her mother. My wife died when she was uh, 14. Uh, came down, uh, was diagnosed with uh, cancer uh, when she was 11. And so she had uh, three years to say goodbye to her mom, and her mom left when she was 14. Uh, during, during COVID, um, she came out as gay, which was kind of a surprise to her. She's never been clear about her sexuality. She's never been sexually active, to my knowledge. And about a year later, came out as um, uh, non-binary, and that's where she is today. And I have never seen her as happy as she is today. I, um, I fully support her, but I'm keeping my eyes on her very, very closely, very concerned. And, uh, and if this is, if this is a, a real and authentic um, self-realization, then I couldn't be happier for her. Um, I just, um, I'm struggling with, as a parent, how I can best support her and mm -hmm. counsel her and love her. And um, I'm, I'm fully okay with gay people. I have no uh, moral judgment on that. And I think I'm fully okay with non-binary people. When it's your own child, uh, everything changes. <laughs> Yeah, first of all, um, in terms of being gay or not, I'm not really dealing with that at all, so I, I can't comment on that. Um, have you talked to her about, was she, did, was she always non-binary or, or didn't realize it until later? And, and to tell you the truth, I'm not sure where non-binary fits into this, because if you're talking gender dysphoria, you strongly feel that your gender is the opposite of your sex, and that's really stressful, and you need to do something to resolve it. Um, I know someone who's non-binary as well, and she just kind of, or they just kind of, that's the way it is. Um, again, you have to look at the individual situation and, and try to figure out. My youngest child is also trans, and this is what kind of got me going through this, and try to understand what, what is really happening. And uh, I'm still struggling to figure it all out. So uh, that's not an answer, because I don't have one for your child. I just wondered about the interplay of losing her mother at adolescence. And, I, and losing yeah. her mother at adolescence, and uh, and how that would might affect, and and yeah. then and then COVID, right. she she says, and I will affirm that she has felt somewhat. Um, she struggled with feelings of of uh, confusion about her self identity sexually that predate the uh, her mother's cancer. Yeah, um, in my case, um, I got divorced when my youngest was fourteen. And then, you know, son-mother connections, and then I was, I had the kids. And so I wonder the same sort of thing, how did that affect the family? That's water under the bridge right now, so. Sorry, I can't say a whole lot more than that. But. Other questions? I'm interested to connect the two talks. Um, do you have any idea, or, may, or maybe they do, if there's any correlation between the MRI data and the, like the DNA methylation data, that kind of a thing? Any, anything about that? I'm, so you're wondering whether, well, MRI data is done from living people, yeah. and you can't do epigenetic studies of the brain until they're dead. So... I'm thinking it would, would have to be the brain, because um, things like methylation and histone acetylation, they would occur um, under specific contexts. And I think you know, things like a hormonal imbalance, that might be interesting to look at the brains of people um, who were um, lifelong gender dysphoric. And I don't know if epigenetic studies have been done of those. Um, maybe the only thing I'll say is that uh, when we, um, 
we're visiting the Capel Lab, uh, which is one of the, the best places in the world for science of sex determination at Duke University. Uh, Blanche mentioned to our, our team that was visiting that uh, the trans community is very interested in the research that they're doing on sex determination. Uh, and, you know, she just kind of left it at that, saying that, um, you know, there's, there's a whole range of ethical issues that come to uh, understanding how things play out in human populations versus mice and the connection between what they're learning about sex determination and also experiences of gender dysphoria and other things. So, uh, you're in, you know, the question is right where lots of people's minds go. It's just that we're kind of, um, that's kind of where we're at. The other challenge, though, is um, as bringing in last night's, last, last night's talk is I think gender is, is an emergent property. So, you know, we don't know what structure of the brain is involved in gender because I think it's actually probably a wiring type of, type of thing. Uh, and so where do you look in the brain to see if there are epigenetic differences? That's hard to say. We have time. Is it a single tweet style question? We have about... Okay. Do I have a single tweet question? We have one. I can give up to one minute for the. Okay. Then let's thank Tony for his wonderful presentation. Thank you.